Good evening and welcome to the 21st Annual Higginbotham Leadership Awards Gala, brought to you by the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. Tonight's gala is all about celebrating the individuals in our community who fight for equity, justice, and the dignity of all people. Tonight is all about making the promises of democracy real. We'll be honoring five individuals whose actions over the past year have helped make our country a more fair place. They are Congresswoman Stacy Plaskett, Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison, two-time WNBA champion and vice president and part owner of the Atlanta Dream, Renee Montgomery, Big Ten Conference Commissioner, Kevin Warren, and chairman of the board and CEO of Bank of America, Brian Moynihan. Tonight's program also includes a fireside chat featuring Lawyers Committee President and Executive Director Damon Hewitt and CNN Senior Analyst and Sirius XM host Laura Coates. Our guest host for this evening is Soledad O'Brien, an award-winning journalist, talk show host, philanthropist, activist, friend of the Lawyers Committee, and past recipient of its Distinguished Civil Rights Advocate Award. Please welcome Soledad O'Brien. Good evening. On behalf of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, welcome to the 2021 Higginbotham Leadership Awards Gala. My name is Soledad O'Brien and I am honored to serve as your host for this prestigious event. The Higginbotham Gala is named in honor of the Honorable Judge A. Leon Higginbotham Jr., a pioneering civil rights advocate, celebrated statesman, author, professor, historian, and federal appeals court judge. Among other accomplishments, Judge Higginbotham was appointed by President John F. Kennedy to the Federal Trade Commission. He founded Philadelphia's first African-American law firm, and he served as the head of a local chapter of the NAACP. The Lawyers Committee would not exist without the fearless trailblazing of people like Judge Higginbotham. And we're honored to have you join us tonight, not only to celebrate the legacy of Judge Higginbotham, but also to celebrate this evening's honorees, people of great distinction who share many of Judge Higginbotham's extraordinary traits. For those of you who don't know, the Lawyers Committee was founded in 1963 at the behest of President Kennedy to mobilize the nation's attorneys in the fight for civil rights. Through and though the call to action was rooted in the need to address racial discrimination against black people, over the years the organization's work has also helped all Americans by strengthening critical institutions and challenging laws and policies that undermine free and full participation in civic life, one of the most important promises of our democracy. Today, the Lawyers Committee taps a vast network of leading lawyers from law firms and corporations nationwide to provide essential pro bono legal services to the cases and issues that threaten to break that promise. Tonight, the Lawyers Committee will honor five remarkable leaders whose actions over the past year have helped push the needle toward a fairer and more just American democracy. The honorees include a Fortune 100 CEO whose sense of corporate responsibility has led to a more diverse and inclusive workplace, as well as a commitment to invest in the health and wealth of communities facing economic and racial inequality amidst a global pandemic. Elected officials who've used the instruments of government to create fair results by challenging and prosecuting those who trampled the rights of people of color and two executives in the world of professional and collegiate athletics, whose vocal leadership and bold stances over the past year demonstrate that athletes can be leaders with a powerful moral compass that points in the direction of true equity. 
I want to personally thank all of you for supporting the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, whether through your direct involvement or through your financial gifts. Without your support, the Lawyers Committee wouldn't be nearly as effective in its mission. Your support means that more Americans get to vote and have their ballots count. More people will live in affordable housing and enjoy safe communities. More children and families will secure educational equity, economic opportunity, freedom from discrimination and hate. And more people will be able to hold police accountable and exercise the right to protest when these other rights are denied. So thank you for joining us and for your continued support. We have an extraordinary evening in front of us filled with inspiring people and moving conversations. So let's get started with our program. It's now my pleasure to begin this special evening by introducing the new leader of this storied organization. Damon Hewitt, with whom I had the pleasure of sharing the screen many years ago when we both took part in Spike Lee's highly acclaimed documentary, When the Levees Broke. As a native of New Orleans and a longtime civil rights attorney, Damon put his legal skills to work for his community after Hurricane Katrina and has continued to do so. Damon has more than 20 years of civil rights litigation and policy experience. He's worked in all sectors, nonprofit, philanthropic, and public, and previously served as the Lawyers Committee's Executive Vice President, where he coordinated strategic, programmatic, and operational efforts to advance the fight for racial justice. It is wonderful to see that his passion for justice and equality has brought him full circle to take this distinct and unique mantle and guide this organization at an unprecedented moment in our nation. He is a phenomenal leader and an outstanding role model. So please join me in welcoming Damon Hewitt. Thanks, Soledad. Good evening, everyone. It's truly an honor to be with you for our 21st annual A. Leon Higginbotham Leadership Awards Gala. Tonight, we recognize a dynamic group of leaders for their commitment to racial justice, diversity in the workplace, and support for making the promises of our democracy real for all people, but especially black and brown communities. In the past year, we have seen massive protests for racial justice, a global public health emergency. And we've also faced unprecedented challenges that have threatened the very foundations of our democracy and all the progress we've made in past years. But these moments of crisis can also present us with an opportunity. We know that progress toward racial justice doesn't occur in a straight line. It can be a winding, sometimes baffling journey that can come with setbacks. Progress toward racial justice is an arduous and complicated project, one that requires people of conscience to join forces and leverage our collective gifts and talents to make our country a better, fairer, and more just place. In fact, I think of American democracy itself as a work in progress. Tonight is about celebrating those who put in that work to make the promises of our democracy real and accessible to everyone. I'm beyond excited to highlight their contributions and to remind us all about the great possibilities that await us. I'd like to thank our event sponsors for their generous support, our tremendous board of directors and executive committee, our outstanding staff who work so hard every day, and you in the audience for helping to make our work possible. We would not be able to make the positive impacts for the communities we serve without each and every one of you. Every organization has a story. We want to turn now to a short video that will tell you a bit more about the Lawyers Committee story and the work our staff does in the fight for voting rights, stopping hate, addressing the inequities in our justice system, and so much more. There are very few things that end up changing the world forever. This past year has been one of reckoning, reflection, growth, and perseverance. We remember the movement for Black Lives that ignited during the summer of 2020. We remember the violent insurrection that was an attack on democracy itself and the rise of voter suppression. We remember social distancing and solidarity and how the demand for police accountability has become a nationwide outcry. But we continue to fight. 2020 was one of the most important years of the Lawyers Committee's history because of everything that happened. You had the presidential election, you had COVID-19, you had the racial justice moments, uh, 
caused by the death of George Floyd and other events. And it was a moment that the Lawyers Committee had to meet, and we did. We participated in over 80 lawsuits in 2020 to meet that moment, and we vindicated the rights of black people and other people of color in those cases. The current moment is really important for civil rights because we are at a pivotal point in our country. We've experienced a lot of things that highlighted a lot of racial inequalities. We had the pandemic, which highlighted inequalities in housing, healthcare, education. For almost 60 years, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law has mobilized a network of leading lawyers in the private bar to provide essential pro bono legal services to tackle the most critical racial justice issues of our time. Today, the Lawyers Committee continues that mission, fighting inside and outside the courts to challenge bad actors who have taken direct action to weaken democracy. We fought against white supremacy and have shown time and time again that we are stronger than hate. America has refused from its founding to extend the rights of citizenship to every person who lives here. Those we call founders were only committed to property owning white men and the law, custom, the economy, still accrues to that specific class. On December 12th, a group of Proud Boys and their affiliates came onto our church's property and destroyed our Black Lives Matter sign while chanting whatever racist slogans they were chanting to energize themselves during that criminal activity. And we engaged the Lawyers Committee so that we could get justice for ourselves and to ensure that those who participated in that criminal act are brought to justice. The Lawyers Committee has been, first of all, responsive to our emotional needs after such a devastating event, but more so, they have enlisted extremely gifted legal minds from within the Lawyers Committee and the persons they have pulled together to work on our case. And we feel like we've got the best representation, but also fine human beings who share our vision of what the world should be, that our rights as citizens should in no way be abridged, and that we do whatever is necessary to protect people who are supposed to be considered citizens of the United States of America. The 2020 election was so incredibly important for our country for so many reasons. Uh, one, there had been this, this notion, this suggestion of voter fraud kind of injected into the national discourse that had so many people in the midst of a pandemic especially concerned. We were concerned about access, about people feeling safe to be able to vote and to remain healthy. It was also a, a, a turning point, if you will, in our country in terms of the political divide. And of course, what we do with the election protection effort. The election protection work is at the forefront of the Lawyers Committee and the continued struggles and issues involving voting rights. Election protection is a brand. Everybody knows 866 Our Vote. Helping voters understand the process, anything from where they vote to whether or not they are eligible to vote. Criminal justice, voting rights, fair housing, and community development are just some of the issue areas we tackle to advance racial justice for black and brown communities. Everything from the past and the present is something that we have to fight right now. So there's no time to waste, no time to be quiet, no time to really be still. We have to take on every aspect of the most critical civil rights and human rights issues right now. There's an incredible urgency to this moment, and that's what I've learned that this work has to be done every day with incredible intensity. Our democracy is hanging in the balance. The Lawyers Committee has been there fighting and will continue to be here, stepping up to the challenges our communities face. We believe in a future where racial justice is at the center of the conversation. This is a all hands on deck historical moment and no organization is better suited to bring talent, resources into that fight. This is the kind of moment for which the Lawyers Committee was created.
Unfortunately, it's still in 2021 as important as ever for firms to be doing pro bono work because unfortunately there's a you know, current attack on the rights of historically disadvantaged groups. And I think lawyers need to step up and firms need to step up uh, to provide representation to push back against that. It sets the right tone and sends the right message and provide a lot of opportunity to train the next generation of lawyers. Working with the Lawyers Committee this past year has required me to take a step back and view the world from a different light, understanding that there are issues and disparities in black and brown communities, and the Lawyers Committee is a place that can effectuate change and solve problems to help those in need and those communities. Please welcome the Lawyers Committee's dynamic co-chairs, Judge Shira Shendlin, former U.S. District Court Judge for the Southern District of New York and partner at the Strook & Strook & Levan Law Firm, and Joseph West, partner and Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at the Duane Morris Law Firm. Thank you, Soledad. Good evening. My name is Shira Shendlin, and I serve as co-chair of the Lawyers Committee Board of Directors along with my colleague, Joseph West. We are delighted to be a part of this wonderful celebration. What you just saw in that video is but a small fraction of all of the great work that the Lawyers Committee is able to accomplish with the help of partners like you. The Lawyers Committee is uniquely situated to serve as a hub for law firms and corporate counsel to engage in impactful pro bono matters on behalf of communities seeking justice and to have their voices heard. We are proud to leverage the power and resources of the bar to bring about actual, effective, and tangible change. When government officials in Georgia tried to enforce unwarranted and stringent voter identification laws for communities of color, the Lawyers Committee took action. And when military style force was used against peaceful protesters in Washington, DC, the Lawyers Committee stepped in to defend them. I spent 22 years as a federal district court judge. I presided over settlements, motions, discovery, and trials, both civil and criminal, including the trial that ended, ended the unconstitutional stop and frisk practices in New York City. I have seen how justice and democracy can work and when it has failed and I know it cannot work on its own. The Lawyers Committee takes action every single day to make sure that our democracy works for everyone, not only a chosen few. I urge you to take us seriously when we tell you that we need your help. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight about the importance of the Lawyers Committee work. And now I'll pass it off to my colleague, Joseph West. Thank you, Judge Shinlin. My co-chair, Judge Shinlin, is right. With your support, the Lawyers Committee is able to safeguard democracy. With your support, the Lawyers Committee is able to tap into the largest pro bono legal network in the country. It's only with your help that this critical work can continue. I don't need to remind anyone that this is an unprecedented time in our country's history. And we all have the opportunity, in fact, the obligation to take action, to make real the promise of democracy for all. Over the course of my career as a corporate officer, a trial lawyer, and a partner at a large law firm, I've had the incredible privilege to partner with many organizations working to end discrimination. But I can say unequivocally that none of them have had the depth of reach or the impact of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights under law. But to continue this very important work, the Lawyers Committee needs your support. I ask you to give and to give boldly. We've seen too much as a country to not recognize the very important work and the urgency of the Lawyers Committee's work. Now, there are a couple of ways you can give. You can text the number on the screen, or you can donate 
by way of lawyerscommittee.org slash real. That's lawyerscommittee.org slash R-E-A-L. I ask you, I urge you to donate now to fuel the work of the Lawyers Committee. Thank you for helping the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law to make the promise of our democracy real. Thank you so much, Joe and Judge Shinlin. Please support the important work of the Lawyers Committee. This organization is doing dynamic work to advance racial justice. I hope that you choose to take action and support the Lawyers Committee today. At this point, I am very excited to officially begin the 2021 Higginbotham Awards Ceremony, so let's dive right in. The first award of the evening is the Distinguished Civil Rights Advocate Award, which recognizes an individual whose leadership reflects an enduring commitment to protecting civil rights and promoting the dignity and worth of every human being, regardless of race, gender, or social status. The Lawyers Committee is honored to present this year's Distinguished Civil Rights Advocate Award to Congresswoman Stacey E. Plaskett, U.S. Representative from the Virgin Islands. Now serving in her fourth term in the House of Representatives, Congresswoman Stacey Plaskett, representing the U.S. Virgin Islands, is the first member of Congress from a U.S. territory to serve on the exclusive House Committee on Ways and Means, and only the fourth African-American woman to do so. Congresswoman Plaskett's vision for America is one where all have an opportunity to participate in the fullness of our democracy. Confronting core issues of racial equity head on, she has used her presence on the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, the House Committee on Oversight and Reform, and the Committee on Agriculture to advocate for legislation that promotes rural development in infrastructure and innovation, access to high-speed broadband, small business support, and community and economic development. Long before entering the political stage, Congresswoman Plaskett stood for the oppressed, protesting apartheid in South Africa, advocating for diversity at the U.S. Department of Justice, and pressing the federal government to rapidly respond to the needs of Americans in disaster-stricken areas. When our democracy was under threat after the violent January 6 assault on the Capitol, Congresswoman Plaskett stepped up to the plate to serve as a House manager during our nation's fourth ever impeachment proceedings. She played a major role in highlighting the negative effects of the attack and the former president's incitement to violence in undermining the integrity and stability of our democracy. A selfless and compassionate advocate, Congresswoman Plaskett has dedicated her life to using her vast skills to leverage opportunities for the underserved. And we are pleased to recognize her service with the Distinguished Civil Rights Advocate Award. Congratulations. Please welcome Congresswoman Stacey Plaskett. Thank you so much, Soledad, for that lovely introduction. Hello and good evening, everyone. I'm Congresswoman Stacey Plaskett of the United States Virgin Islands. But before I continue, I would just like to start by giving a special thank you to the President and Executive Director, Damon Hewitt, and members of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law for presenting me with this award tonight. I'd also like to congratulate my fellow 2021 honorees for their accomplishments in the other prestigious awards given as well. As I compare tonight's theme, making the promises of our democracy real to the objectives of the Distinguished Civil Rights Advocate Award, it describes who many of the preceding honorees are at heart, what they do, and the results of their dedication and determination to see change through the communities in which they serve. I am honored to be recognized as the 2021 Distinguished Civil Rights Advocate and join many distinctive honorees, including two of my peers and phenomenal black women leaders, my soror, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, and colleague and big sis, Auntie Congresswoman Maxine Waters, whose leadership, actions, and livelihood truly do emulate the mission and values of civil rights advocacy. I stand before you tonight, not only representing the people of the Virgin Islands in the U.S. House of Representatives, but my female ancestors in the Virgin Islands, 
who thought freedom, justice, and equality were more important even than life. The 1737 Akwamu women in St. John, who were among the 150 African slave insurrectionists that held the island for months. The Queens of Fireburn, who in 1878 led the labor riots on St. Croix for better pay and all of the other fearless women. I am humbly accept the 2021 Distinguished Civil Rights Advocate Award at the time when our lives, especially for people of African descent here in the United States and abroad, and for other racial and ethnic minorities who seem to be so easily forgotten about, discriminated against, and seen as less than equal. I could speak to all people of all ages, ethnicities, backgrounds, etc., but tonight I'm speaking especially to my beautiful black women at the front of the fight for civil rights. In essence of time, and to keep it light, I'll leave you with this. We have come a mighty long way from being seen as someone's property with no legal standing and no rights of our own. We have come a mighty long way from the first Civil Rights Act of 1964, in which civil rights and labor laws in the US made it illegal to discriminate based on race, color, religion, sex, national origin, and now to include sexual orientation and gender identity. And our nation still has many miles to go on that road to true racial equality. Thank you. Again, to our host for this evening during the virtual Aloysius Leon Higginbotham Corporate Leadership Awards Gala, to Soledad O'Brien for the kind introduction, and finally, thank you to the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law for choosing me as this year's recipient of the Distinguished Civil Rights Advocate Award. Have a wonderful rest of your evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Congresswoman Plaskett, you are truly a champion of fulfilling our nation's unrealized promise of equality and justice for all, and your efforts inspire us to continue the struggle. So congratulations and thank you. Up next, we will present the Legacy of Justice Award, which recognizes an individual who's demonstrated an extraordinary commitment to advancing racial justice and civil rights on behalf of underserved communities. The Lawyers Committee is honored to present this year's Legacy of Justice Award to Minnesota's Attorney General Keith Ellison in acknowledgement of his courageous and extraordinary commitment to promoting and protecting civil rights, as well as his dynamic leadership as a public servant, role model, and mentor. Let's learn a little bit more about the Honorable Keith Ellison. Hailing from a family deeply involved in the civil rights movement, including a grandfather who served as an NAACP president, Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison grew up with a keen sense of the struggle for racial justice. Inspired by the likes of Thurgood Marshall and Walter White, Ellison became a civil rights attorney. He led the Legal Rights Center in Minneapolis, where he provided legal counsel and social justice advocacy for low-income community members. His decorated career of public service continued with being elected to the Minnesota House of Delegates, where he became the first African-American and Muslim representative of Minnesota, providing over a decade of exemplary service as a member of Congress. Following the killings of Breonna Taylor, Philando Castile, and countless others at the hands of police, many doubted that the police would be held accountable for the murder of George Floyd. But Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison didn't allow the skepticism or the difficult legal hurdles to deter him from pursuing justice for the Floyd family. After taking over the prosecution, Attorney General Ellison pursued the more serious charges of second-degree murder and third-degree murder against former police officer Derek Chauvin and successfully led the team that secured a rare conviction of a police officer. This historic victory in pursuit of racial justice brought some sense of peace to Mr. Floyd's family and delivered some semblance of accountability for black and brown communities across the country in the process. Attorney General Ellison's work is a testament to what can be accomplished when we choose to champion the human rights of all people and center the experiences of people of color. The Lawyers Committee is proud to recognize his tremendous leadership with the Legacy of Justice Award. Wow, what a wonderful award. I'm so grateful for this recognition. 
I want to accept it on behalf of the entire Floyd prosecution team, uh, the entire uh, office of the Minnesota Attorney General's office, and everybody who stands for justice. Uh, thank you, Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. This wonderful award, Legacy of Justice, I cannot thank you enough on behalf of all the people who I accept this award on behalf of. And uh, I just want you to know that you're putting a lot of pressure on me because now I got to keep on trying to deliver some justice. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much. Attorney General Ellison, your work is a testament to your unrelenting dedication to promoting justice and equality for all. When the nation's eyes were on Minnesota, you delivered simple justice. So congratulations to you and thank you. At this moment, we're going to shift the program a little bit and hear from the Lawyers Committee's new leader. But before we do, we have some very special people that have joined us this afternoon to help mark this special occasion. So let's hear from them now. I am Jane Sherburn, a former co-chair of the Lawyers Committee and a current member of the board's executive committee. Damon, I am thrilled to have you at the helm of the Lawyers Committee and so grateful to Kristen Clark for having brought you on board as her deputy and positioning us so well to have you step in as her successor without missing a beat. And as you know so well, this is not the moment to miss a beat. I can say without hesitation that the board has great confidence in your leadership and your capacity to act strategically and with great effect. Skills and attributes amply on display already and we know you will bring out the best in the Lawyers Committee incredibly talented and dedicated staff. I appreciate you as a colleague and as a friend, and I look forward to supporting you as you face the challenges ahead. So glad you're in the seat. Good evening. I'm Wade Henderson, the interim president and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. After working with Damon Hewitt since his days as an attorney with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, I can name a scant few whom I'd rather be in the trenches with in the fight for social justice than Damon. He's a creative and strategic thinker and a voice for principle and reason. Damon is an inspired choice to lead the Lawyers Committee, and I'm extremely pleased both for him and this venerable organization. I also want to shout out the honorees for the Higginbotham Leadership Awards, and most especially to my personal friends, Brian Moynihan, Chairman and CEO of Bank of America, and Keith Ellison, the hard-hitting Attorney General of Minnesota. Congratulations to all the honorees, to the entire Lawyers Committee team, and to Damon on this special evening in a wonderfully distinguished career. Thank you. Sometimes they get it right. Damon Hewitt as the head of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, hip hip hooray. I couldn't be more thrilled to have the right leader at such a critical organization at this critical juncture. So let's get to work, Damon. We got work to do and the country's counting on you and you know that I have your back and looking forward to working with you. Hello everyone. It's so exciting to be joining the Lawyers Committee's 2021 Higginbotham event. My name is Margaret Huang and I'm the president and CEO of the Southern Poverty Law Center. I'm thrilled that Damon has stepped into the role of president and executive director of the Lawyers Committee. His leadership, his experience, and his passion for racial justice are exactly what our movement needs at this moment. Congratulations, friends, on selecting the right person to lead the Lawyers Committee forward. I can't wait to work alongside you in the struggle for justice. Damon Hewitt, congratulations on your selection uh, as the new head of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. Uh, you are, Damon, uh, one of uh, the best civil rights lawyers in this country. I've known you for about 25 years now, and I've watched you grow. Uh, I've watched you as you have become a premier litigator, but also as you have become a leader. And I am so proud of you as you take on this important position. We're in challenging times. Uh, we all know that. 
Um, and in these times, we need strong leadership. Uh, you are the right person for the right job at the right time. And I have no question uh, that the Lawyers Committee Board has served itself well uh, by selecting you. You will lead the staff well and uh, the lawyers around the country uh, who work uh, in uh, fulfillment of civil rights. So Damon, uh, I'm proud of you. Godspeed, Damon. Do good and do well as you've done for so long now. Hi. Hi, Damon. Um, we're so incredibly proud of you. Um, so inspired and honored that you're able to lead such a wonderful organization and that you're still able to uh, be a great partner and father to our wonderful children, including our oldest, Amina. We love you and we're proud of you. Bye. That was so heartwarming. Now that you've heard from his family and friends and colleagues, it's time for a fireside chat with the Lawyers Committee's new president and executive director, Damon Hewitt, in conversation with the phenomenal Laura Coates. You know Laura, of course, as a talented senior legal analyst and anchor at CNN and the host of the Laura Coates show on the Sirius XM radio, but she's also a former federal prosecutor and civil rights attorney, previously serving as a trial attorney in the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice during both the Bush and Obama administrations. Laura and Damon's discussion will focus on tonight's theme, which is making the promises of democracy real. So please join me in welcoming Laura Coates and Damon Hewitt. I'm Laura Coates, and it is my pleasure to introduce you to Damon Hewitt. He is the President and Executive Director for the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. It's a pleasure to talk to him today and get to know him in this way. Thanks, Laura, for being with us and for continuing to partner with the Lawyers Committee. Damon, I'm so glad that you're here. Not only are you a person who has been dedicated to civil rights throughout your life, you really are a son of the South. Uh, you're right. I am a son of the South, born and raised. Uh, in New Orleans, Louisiana, an alumnus of Louisiana State University. Uh, didn't cross the Mason-Dixon line until I went to law school. As I understand, in your hometown, in your city, it is the same city where Ruby Bridges integrated a school six years after Brown versus Board of Education. And that was really a formative part of your life, going to a school, frankly, where the legacy of Brown v. Board had yet to be realized. That's exactly right. You know, when people look at that Norman Rockwell painting of Ruby Bridges depicted entering William France Elementary School, uh, people think about that snapshot in time, but they don't often think about the days, the weeks, the decades that follow, frankly. Now, fast forward to the early 1990s, I was a student in New Orleans public schools. At that point, however, the public schools were almost all majority black. In fact, there was only one majority white public high school, and that happened to be the Math and Science Elite Magnet School. I was fortunate to attend that school because of the academic offerings, but the irony, the disparity, uh, never left me. It always haunted me, this notion that the elite opportunities aren't made as widely available, certainly not proportionately, to black students who are just as deserving, just as smart, uh, and can do just as much as anyone else. And of course, I'm sure you were aware that was no coincidence. No coincidence, coincidence at all. You know, it's a matter of conscious choices, policies, and structural. And look, this even happens uh, when you have black people or brown people in power, uh, because we're talking about lower structural racism and discrimination, not just individual bad actors. Uh, it's about all the structures and systems in which we operate and navigate that hold us all back, quite frankly. And that's such a powerful statement that you just made because it's often the assumption of so many people that racism, systemic or structural or otherwise, is really only born by those who are in black and brown communities. But it really, racism hurts us all. Well, racism does hurt us all. You know, it has a cost that runs deep and is sometimes not readily apparent, uh, but in many cases it certainly is. Racism can cost us our health, in terms of the disparities, but when you think about a, a global pandemic, a particular community being hurt actually hurts everyone. Racism can cost us our wealth. 
and not just in terms of individual families or communities, but the overall economy, not just people in uh, urban centers or in Appalachia, but frankly, all throughout the country. Uh, we also have learned the hard way that racism can cost us even more. It can cost us our entire democracy. When you look at the racialized attacks on election systems, on election workers, and even on the U.S. Capitol, racism can cost us everything if we let it. And that's why we have to stand in the breach to make sure that does not happen. And one of the main areas I know that has been top of mind with the Lawyers Committee and so many advocates across the country has been voter suppression. The Lawyers Committee has had a very big role historically and continues to have a big role in trying to make sure that the gains of the Voting Rights Act remain and can be fortified yet again, right? That's right. The Voting Rights Act is one of the most important pieces of legislation Congress has ever adopted that's ever been signed into law by a president. And historically, it's actually had bipartisan support, reauthorized under Republican presidents such as Nixon, Reagan, and George W. Bush. Uh, the last time the Voting Rights Act was reauthorized in the Bush years, uh, it had a 98 to 0 vote in favor in the U.S. Senate, with, with two senators not voting. And so you, you compare that to today when it's difficult to even get a vote on the floor in the Senate uh, because it's not even included that there are 50 votes sometimes uh, for some of these provisions, quite honestly. But what we realize is the need for the Voting Rights Act in 1965 and when it was reauthorized in 82 and 2006 really does remain. Exhibit A is all of the voter suppression bills that we've seen nationwide after the Supreme Court's decision in the Shelby County case in 2013. Uh, if racism and discrimination in voting were not a problem, we would not see all of those bills. We would not see active efforts to target the specific means that communities of color use to cast their ballots. So voting rights is a contested space because it's all about determining who has power in this country. And whoever has power sets the narrative, whoever has power controls the resources in terms of dollars and otherwise, and whoever has power defines what the reality is for communities. And if we're focused on self-determination for communities of color, they deserve not just opportunity, they deserve and need voice and power. And that's why we're focused on how we can help build power for those communities whose voice is too often unheard. Well, you understand deeply, Damon, the idea of being in a position to make commands before you have to concede a point. And this is something that's been in part the legacy of people who have been influential to this organization, including somebody who has been a personal hero of yours, Judge Higginbotham. Tell me a little bit about how his life has influenced your own. Well, I'm an alumnus of the University of Pennsylvania Law School. And you cannot be a Philadelphia law student or a classic Philadelphia lawyer without knowing about Judge Higginbotham and the other giants. I was a law student watching Judge Higginbotham. This was just weeks before he passed away, sadly. And he talked in response to a congressman's questions about real Americans, as if real Americans weren't people who looked like him. And Judge Higginbotham you know, talked about his mother and his father, who were laborers and domestics, and said, these are real Americans, too. Mm -hmm. And just him claiming that space and him taking that stand and speaking truth to power inspired me. Just a few weeks later, Judge Higginbotham passed away. And it was, frankly, on the eve of one of my most challenging uh, law school exams. And I was up late studying, and I thought to myself, it's time. The mantle's being passed. We are the ones now who have to take up this cause. His legacy, uh, his stand, lifted me to do my best in law school and to also pursue this career as a civil rights and racial justice lawyer. Damon, when you think about the Lawyers Committee as being result-oriented, as trying to achieve tangible results for people who have been marginalized, who are vulnerable, who can be exploited by so many structural systems that are geared towards trying to do just that. What do you want people to understand about the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and the work that's to be done? We're focused on big demands. We're focused on participatory democracy. We're focused on being stakeholders in this country. We're focused on being able to have an opportunity for intergenerational transfer of wealth, uh, not just a good job. We're focused on having safe communities where safety is defined by community, not by someone else on the outside. 
we're focused on not just having a fighting chance and an opportunity, we're also focused on the outcome. And that's justice. And that's what makes democracy feel tangible and real when in so many realms it just continues to feel so elusive as if it's just words on paper or some high-minded concept. If it's not tangible and accessible to everyone, then it's not going to work for anyone in this country. Damon, Always. a pleasure. Thank you so much, Laura. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you to Laura and Damon for that thoughtful conversation. Laura, it is always a pleasure to hear from you, and thank you for using your voice to bring clarity and perspective to some of the most complex issues of our time. Now, back to our awards presentations. We next present the Beacon of Justice Award, which honors an individual or group whose outstanding leadership promotes justice and equality and inspires others to devote their skills and talents to the cause of social justice. The Lawyers Committee is thrilled to present this year's Beacon of Justice Award to Renee Montgomery, a two-time WNBA champion and now part owner and vice president of the Atlanta Dream. Let's hear about this champion. Renee Montgomery is a two-time WNBA champion and vice president and part owner of the Atlanta Dream. She is also an energetic and insightful sports analyst for the NBA and ESPN and hosts her own podcast, Remotely Renee. Renee has worked tirelessly to promote racial justice, advocate for police reform and accountability, and to champion voting rights for communities of color and the disenfranchised. She has lived by her personal motto, moments make momentum. Last year, Renee made the brave decision to step away from her successful career as a professional athlete to turn the moment of unprecedented violence, hatred, and oppression into momentum for activism, justice, and equality. She embraced the moment for a racial reckoning and used her platform as a professional athlete to speak up in support of Black Lives Matter and to speak out against previous Atlanta Dream Team owner and then U.S. Senator Kelly Leffler's anti-Black Lives Matter stance. Renee and her teammates heightened the national conversation around race, justice, and advocacy. Renee also launched several charitable endeavors to help communities in need. The Lawyers Committee is delighted to present Renee the Beacon of Justice Award. Hello, hello, hello there, everyone. So let me start off by saying, let's go! Uh, I believe in celebrating everything, and when you get something such as the Beacon of Justice Award. You don't set out to win that award. You never set out to win such awards like that. But I have to thank the Higginbotham cor corporate leadership for what they're doing, you know, recognizing community justice work. And that's something that doesn't get a lot of recognition. I don't need any recognition to do it, but I thank you guys for recognizing the efforts that we're doing here. And when I say we're, I have to send a huge shout out to the RMF, Renee Montgomery Foundation squad, that no matter the event, whether it's remember the 3rd of November, recognizing and educating people on voting rights and what you can and can't do and what you need to go to the polls, all the way to coding camps that we throw. Our foundation, we have a wide range of what we want to cover and everybody on my team is always ready and willing for any crazy idea I come up with. Um, and then I also have to send a shout out to Montgomery and Company, and that's what I call my family. That's also my business backing in a sense of when I opted out, I opted out of my job, I opted out of everything that I knew was norm, my normal lifestyle. And my family was there for me to help me build back the pieces and build everything up. And now the things that we're creating... There's people giving us awards for it. It's so crazy. So what turned out as a scary moment that I didn't know what happened is turned into something beautiful, a beautiful moment and so much momentum. And, uh, you know, I always have the saying moments equal momentum. And this is one of those moments. So thank you guys for this award. I will continue the work. The marathon continues. <sighs> Humbling. Thank you guys. Renee, you are a champion, a businesswoman, an activist, truly an inspiration. Congratulations to you and the entire Atlanta Dream organization, and thank you. We now present the Racial Justice Trailblazer Award, which recognizes a visionary whose body of work has cut through barriers and obstacles to promote racial justice and economic opportunity. We are delighted that this year's award recipient is Kevin Warren, Commissioner of the Big Ten Conference. Let's hear about this trailblazer. 
Throughout his career, Kevin Warren has cut through barriers and obstacles to ascend to positions of distinction. He is the first African-American to lead the Big Ten Conference. In fact, he is the first African-American leader of any Power Five collegiate athletic conference. He was also the highest ranking African-American business executive in the history of the National Football League, becoming the first African-American COO of a franchise in NFL history. Commissioner Warren has not only scaled obstacles to executive leadership, he has used his station to open doors for others. While serving as COO for the Minnesota Vikings, Commissioner Warren initiated programs to promote women to executive positions and became a member of the NFL Committee on Workplace Diversity, a committee established to enhance and promote diversity at every level of the NFL. Commissioner Warren created the Big Ten Conference Anti-Hate and Anti-Racism Coalition after the murder of George Floyd, which unites student athletes, coaches, and staff to combat racism and hate around the world. Under Commissioner Warren's visionary leadership, the Big Ten Conference also partnered with the Lawyers Committee to launch a voter registration initiative to encourage student athletes to take part in the electoral process. The Lawyers Committee is delighted to recognize Commissioner Warren's barrier-breaking career and initiatives with the Racial Justice Trailblazer Award. Yeah, I'm, I'm truly humbled, I'm truly honored uh, to even be mentioned in the same voice as the individual like Leon Higginbotham, uh, what he stood for. And, you know, this is a, a, a special, special award. I've been blessed to receive many awards, but this will be an award that, that will, uh, I'll hold near and dear to my heart um, because I think what, what it um, has taught me is what my parents taught me, do the right thing, create an environment where diversity, equity, and inclusion is important. And to be here at the Big Ten Conference, and we, we've been able to, to launch an equality coalition and a voter registration campaign and address issues regarding mental health and wellness that our athletes are facing. Um, and I just can, will continue to do my very, very best, not for awards, but for the protection of our young people in our country, especially our 10,000 student athletes here in the Big Ten Conference. So I say this really on behalf of my parents. Um, you know, thank you. Um, thank you for this honor. I, I, I deeply appreciate it. There's so much more work to be done. We need to come together. We need to trust each other. We need to make decisions based on the right thing at the right time. We need to look beyond, you know, race and, and religion and color and and um, just financial status and sexual orientation. We need to do what's right. We need to recognize that we are all children uh, in the eyes of God, and, uh, and we have a responsibility, especially for our future generations, for us to create an environment that is not only safe and secure, but it energizes our young people to be great. So again, thank you very much for this incredible honor. Uh, I'm humbled. And uh, you have my word that I will continually work each and every day uh, to make you proud. Have a great night and God bless you. Commissioner Warren, we appreciate your leadership and partnership, including your support of the Lawyers Committee election protection efforts last year. Congratulations on your achievements and thank you. And now we turn to the evening's marquee award. The Lawyers Committee created the A. Leon Higginbotham Corporate Leadership Award to recognize exemplary corporate leadership with respect to advancing diversity and equal opportunity and to particularly highlight leadership in recruiting and retaining and promoting members of diverse communities in the workplace. Before introducing this year's outstanding honoree, let's hear a little bit more about the award's namesake, Judge A. Leon Higginbotham. We are delighted to welcome F. Michael Higginbotham, the Joseph Curtis Professor of Law at the University of Baltimore School of Law, to give remarks on behalf of the Higginbotham family. Good evening, valued friends and guests. Thank you so much for joining us tonight to honor these uh, workers, these 
awardees who are on the front lines, who are fighting every day for helping to strengthen our American constitutional democracy. I am honored once again to represent the Higginbotham family at this most important event. The Higginbotham family is indebted and deeply grateful to the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law for helping to keep the legacy and the life of my beloved uncle, A. Leon Higginbotham, Jr., to help to keep his life and legacy alive. My uncle was an amazing human being, a brilliant lawyer, a productive scholar, and a wise and fair jurist. He brought to each one of these endeavors the three C's, the indicia of great leadership, commitment, compassion, and courage. I am convinced that he would be greatly honored to have his name connected with tonight's awardees who have done so much uh, to continue uh, what he felt so strongly about. But I am also equally convinced that he would be deeply dismayed, deeply disappointed at the fact that what these awardees are dedicated to and what these awardees are doing every day is still necessary in our society to help to increase justice and equality. The Lawyers Committee is at the forefront of what we are doing today in trying to increase equality. One day I hope the extraordinary work of these awardees will become commonplace. Until then, it's up to each one of us to try and help and strengthen the American democracy, to try and work for the American people, to make this place better, and to try and help to create more equity and inclusion in our society. I want to thank the Lawyers Committee for being a beacon of hope, a beacon of light in today's struggle with respect to issues of racial justice, with respect to voting rights, and with respect to police reform and accountability. The Lawyers Committee, its leadership, and its staff are working to make America a better place, to make sure that we have equity and inclusion throughout our society. Please join them in this important fight and join them beginning tonight. Thank you for helping to celebrate the life and legacy of A. Leon Higginbotham, Jr. And let's keep the dream alive for all. Thank you, Michael, for those remarks. We all stand on the shoulders of giants like Judge Higginbotham. To help us introduce tonight's Higginbotham Corporate Leadership Award honoree, we turn to Mark Morial, President and CEO of the National Urban League. Mark Morial is a living legend. Over the last 15 years, he's overseen a huge expansion of the reach of the National Urban League's services and has overseen a movement to create policies that serve communities of color. Before helming the Urban League, Mark was the mayor of the great city of New Orleans. He is the author of The Gumbo Coalition, a collection of lessons on the power of unity in our democracy and a leadership framework for America's change makers. It's something we could all use. He's also a member of the Lawyers Committee's Board of Directors, just like his late father, Ernest N. Morial, the first African-American mayor of New Orleans and a founding member of the Lawyers Committee. So please join me in welcoming Mark Morial. We at the National Urban League have had the privilege and pride to work with Brian Moynihan at Bank of America now for more than 10 years as a member of its National Community Advisory Council. From that perch, I've had an opportunity to see Brian Moynihan in action. 
Brian comes to our meetings, shirt sleeve rolled up, brain turned on, and with his ears tuned in. And it is in those sessions that I've had an opportunity to witness someone who doesn't walk into a meeting like these with talking points and a script, but with a real desire to hear and engage on a wide range of very important issues to black and brown communities, urban communities, and other communities of economic and social disadvantage. Brian Moynihan listens. Uh, he provides candor and feedback. And I've seen numerous times where our input and our recommendations have been embraced and implemented uh, by the bank. I understand and I know that Brian Moynihan understands that equity, and not even equity alone, but equity along with diversity and inclusion and a commitment to fairness have to be in the DNA of a modern American corporation. So Brian Moynihan stands, I think, uh, in a rare, if you will, uh, group of corporate leaders in America today. Now, Brian and I don't share the same sports affinity. You see, he's a Patriots fan, a Red Sox fan, a Celtics fan, and a Bruins fan. I'm a Saints, Pelicans, and Yankees fan. As you can imagine, he's a diehard Bostonian, but don't let that fool you. He's really from Ohio. And in that upbringing, he understands work. He understands fairness. He also understands the value of struggle. With that, I also want to say a warm thanks to your brand new president, Damon Hewitt. Congratulations, Damon. And now it's back to you. Thank you, Mark, for joining us for this special celebration and for those wonderful remarks. We so appreciate your partnership through the National Urban League. In a moment, I'll be presenting Brian with the 2021 Higginbotham Corporate Leadership Award. But before I do, I want to say a few words about Brian's leadership and accomplishments. As chairman of the board and CEO of Bank of America, Brian leads a team of more than 200,000 employees. That's a staggering number of people, a staggering number of lives touched, of hopes, of aspirations. In this role, Brian has shown what true corporate leadership can look like. He's shown that there's no excuse for a CEO who doesn't value the livelihood of their own employees. No excuse for a CEO who doesn't champion diversity in their own workplace and inclusion of people from all walks of life. Under Brian's leadership, Bank of America has been listed several times as an example of a top workplace for diversity, a top workplace for parents like myself, and a top workplace for women. Brian leads Bank of America's Global Diversity and Inclusion Council. He's committed $1.25 billion through a five-year initiative to create opportunity for people and communities of color in the areas of health and healthcare, jobs and reskilling, support for small businesses, and affordable housing. Bank of America has also announced an additional $25 million commitment to help launch a new Smithsonian Institution effort that explores how Americans understand, experience, and confront race, the issue of our time. For all these reasons, and also to inspire other CEOs to follow suit, the Laureus Committee is honored to award Brian Moynihan and the Bank of America family the 2021 Higginbotham Corporate Leadership Award. Congratulations to you, Brian, and the entire Bank of America family. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Now let me start by recognizing the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law and President Damon Hewitt for everything that they do to help create a more just, fair, and equitable society for all. I'd like to add a note of appreciation for our former president, Kristen Clark. Her role as Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights is a testament to the important role the committee plays in our country's future. 
Now, it's an honor to receive this award, which I accept on behalf of my 200,000 teammates from all around the world. This award carries with it the name of one of the greats in the civil rights movement, Leon Higginbotham. Leon's name is associated with progress, with equality, and with opportunity. We at Bank of America, and I am personally humbled to be recognized in that light. We know at Bank of America that our company has to play a role in helping drive progress in society. Our commitment to racial equality and economic opportunity is core to who we are in our company. And that commitment, as we say, begins inside our walls. It begins with a workforce that reflects the diversity of our communities across every dimension. It continues with who we hire and how we develop diverse talent from across society. It also includes how we put in policies that hold our leaders accountable for our teammates to make great progress in their careers. But it also extends to our external activities how we look outside and how we deliver for our clients and customers around the world. We serve one in two households in the United States. We have to ensure that everyone has access to products and services they need to achieve their financial goals, regardless of where they live or what they earn. And we also helping drive equality and economic opportunity within the communities we serve. Following the tragic killing of George Floyd, we accelerated that work with a new $1.25 billion commitment. We're investing that commitment in areas where we see gaps that exist and have existed for far too long. Areas such as jobs, as small business development, housing, and health care. In a single year, we deployed nearly $400 million of that commitment. For decades, we've been working on advancing civil rights, social justice, and economic mobility. We've worked closely with civil rights groups and continue to do so with community leaders to help them understand how and where we can in our company at Bank of America make an impact. We support the work of advocates to create positive change and share their dedication to driving that progress. As we have said many times, this is a movement, not a moment. And there's a lot more work to do. I'd like again to thank the committee for this recognition and for all the great work that you do. So thank you and thank you for this honor. Once again, I would like to offer a hearty and sincere congratulations to all of the honorees of tonight's gala. It's been a privilege to be your host, a privilege to share this virtual stage with such esteemed and accomplished individuals. And now to close Lawyers Committee's 2021 Higginbotham Gala, I'd like to invite back President and Executive Director Damon Hewitt for some closing remarks. I hope you enjoyed tonight's gala. For me, it's been thrilling to recognize some of our community's finest and most exceptional leaders to elevate their accomplishments, both for the purpose of showing our gratitude and also to inspire others to follow suit. So I want to congratulate once again, Congresswoman Stacey Plaskett, Attorney General Keith Ellison, Commissioner Kevin Warren, two-time WNBA champion Renee Montgomery, and Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan. Your awards are well-deserved and your accomplishments are inspirations to us all. Thank you for all that you do in common cause with our mission at the Laureus Committee. I would be remiss if I didn't give you, our friends and partners in the audience, one last opportunity to join us in advancing our mission to make the promises of our democracy real for black and brown communities and everyone across the nation. I'm energized to continue to push for progress and I ask you to consider joining us by making a gift of financial support to fuel this work. Again, you can text the number on screen or donate at lawyerscommittee.org forward slash real, R-E-A-L. The Lawyers Committee's work for racial justice, voting rights, and economic justice is simply not possible without your financial support. Also, we can't close out this evening without giving a hearty thank you to Soledad O'Brien for doing such a terrific job of guiding us through the celebration as our host. Soledad, as always, you were truly exceptional. Thank you for giving so selflessly of your time and tremendous talent to make this event one we won't forget. Likewise, I extend my deepest gratitude to Laura Coates for lending her tremendous skills to this special celebration. Laura, you are a true champion of justice and a masterful analyst. We appreciate your relentless dedication to the cause of civil rights and lifting it up across your platforms. And finally, I want to thank my co-chairs, our board of directors, our amazing executive committee, and of course, our exceptional and dedicated staff for making tonight an extraordinary success and for all that you do every day to advance our mission. 
Thank you for joining us for our 21st annual Ailey and Higginbotham Leadership Awards Gala. We at the Lawyers Committee will continue this work every day, and we ask that each of you stay in this struggle for freedom and democracy for all, with us and for the people we serve. Together, we can make the promises of our democracy real for everyone. Thank you.